Jeremiah chapter 45. Jeremiah chapter 45. Our text will be found in verse 5. This short chapter of five verses here. And our text will be found in verse 5. And the title of my message is A Question. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seekest thou great things for thyself? And we get this obviously from this word here given to this man Baruch, a man of God, a man used of God. And God asked this question to him. He said, And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. For behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But thy life will I give thee for prey in all places, whither thou goest. Now in this text, the Lord is speaking to Jeremiah. He gives the word to Jeremiah in verse 1. He says, the word, the word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch, the son of Nerah, when it was written these words in the book of Jeremiah, in the fourth month of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch. These words were spoken by Jeremiah as the Lord gave him words to speak to this man, Baruch. Now this man, Baruch, was the man who transcribed this book that we have before us. Jeremiah is the prophet. He received the word from God. And as Jeremiah spoke, this man Baruch was given the great honor and privilege of pinning the word, of pinning the word of God for the prophet. He was used of God. And God here has a word for him. And now if we were to take this in, in its order, you would have to understand that this chapter 45 should go directly behind chapter 36. And in chapter 36, this man Baruch, he takes the word that was given of God by Jeremiah and he brings it to the king of Judah. And it is a word of destruction. It is a word of, of, of warning that God is coming to destroy Judah. That God is coming to destroy Jerusalem by this man Nebuchadnezzar. And you know according to this book that God had already determined Seventy years of captivity. It was not a happy message. It was not a, a joyful message. It was one of a need of repentance. And you know, this man Baruch surely expected them to hear God's word. But we learn in chapter 36, you can read this later, that the, that the king, when he heard this letter, he, he got this letter, he tore it up. He was very angry and he sought to take this man Baruch and Jeremiah and kill them. He did not receive the, the, the uh, he didn't think, he didn't receive what he thought he was going to get. He thought he'd be received. He thought it'd be acceptable that they would repent and they would not. It was a time of great affliction for this man Baruch. It was a time of calamity that, the temple was going to be burned. The sacrifices were going to cease. Famine was going to be out throughout the land. Pestilence. And listen to this. No one would escape. That was the word of God. No one would escape. The righteous would suffer with the wicked. The sword would smite the beloved of God as well as the idolater and blasphemer. God's people would starve as well as the, uh, those who hated God. This was a dark time that was to come. And this was the man God chose to bring this message to them. Can you imagine the anguish and despair of this man after he had brought a message that's saying, repent, repent. God is going to destroy us, repent. And they tore it up and sought his life. It was a... It was a time of great agony, a great sorrow that his whole nation was going to be destroyed. Look at what happens in, in verse 3. This is what God said about him. He said, Thou didst say, Woe is me now. 
For the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I've fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Now this man, like all believers, suffered anguish and sorrow. How many times have we expected by the preaching of the word that people would hear it? And then they don't. We suppose that sinners would love to hear the gospel of Christ and they hate it. This brings us great sorrow. This brings us great affliction. But not only this, we live in a world that hates this gospel, that hates our Lord and despises us. And now the Lord, after purposing this sure destruction, He adds grief and sorrow to Him. All believers know this too well. As we live in a constant warfare, we live in a constant struggle with ourselves, our flesh, and the world. We are in constant sorrow over our own sin. We're constant sorrow. But God, instead of usually, we would suppose maybe God would give us a reprieve. And what does God often do? He compounds our sorrow. This man Baruch, He was sorrowful what was going to happen to his country, but now he compounds that sorrow by these men rejecting it and seeking his life. Can you not identify with this in your struggles, in your troubles, in your difficulties, believer, in this life? That it seems as though God is intent. God is intent to destroy us at times. It seems as though the billows of of, and waves of sorrow come over us and we find no rest. We faint because of our sighing. Can you not identify with this man? He says, woe is me. Woe now. Woe now. For the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted because of my sighing and I find no rest. But now in our text, I want us to see that the Lord sees deep into the heart of this man. Even where Baruch could not see. He sees so deep inside of this man that this man could not see. And he exposes the secret chamber of this man's heart by this piercing question. Look at what he says now. He says in verse 5, Seekest thou great things for thyself? In the midst of this man's sorrow, the Lord is getting to the root of the problem. The root of his sorrow is this. He sought great things, not for the glory of God, but for himself. But for himself. It seems that Baruch had cherished and longed for some secret ambition to seek some great thing for himself. And his grief and his uh, grief and sorrow was rooted in his not for his love for God or concern for the glory of God, but it was compounded. His grief and sorrow was compounded not only by the Lord's providence to destroy this, but listen, his own secret ambition. So now I ask, I want this question to be not just applied to this man, but to us. In the midst of our sorrow, in the midst of our struggle, God asked this question. Seekest thou great things for thyself? You are believers in Christ. Are we not guilty of this same thing? This morning, by the grace of God, I hope the Lord God will teach us the foolishness of this. Seeking great things for ourselves. And then, I hope by God's grace, when you see that, when you see the vanity of seeking great things for yourself, it is my heart's desire that God would teach us and comfort us concerning the great things God has done for us. Great things that God has promised us. So let's see three things here. I, must, I want to see the evil of, and vanity of seeking great things for ourselves. Then I want us to show the purpose of God in our afflictions. The purpose of God in the affliction of this man and the purpose of God 
in afflicting uh, his people. And then I want us to see, lastly, the promise of God. The promise of God. So first of all, the evil of seeking great things for ourselves. Now the heart of Baruch, this evil lurked in his heart, and it surely lurks in the heart of every one of us. Both of us are sons of Adam, are we not? Both of us are sons of Adam. We confess that we have before coveted great things concerning the flesh. Concerning the flesh. And you know what's with believers, what makes it so bad is that not only we, do we covet the things of the flesh, but we try to cover it up as though we're uh, wanting to glorify God. We have pretenses. We make pretenses as though it's for the glory of God. The first thing that the natural flesh of, of man seeks is the great things of this world. The great things of this world, such as riches. Riches. The comforts of this world. The honor of worldly men. But let us see that even believers, the world seeks after those things, but we do too. Is that not so? Have you not sought those things? We seek these things. These, this ambition, this passion, affects all men in every station, from the peasant to the king. From those who are, are rulers to the commoner. We all are looking for a better condition in this life. We want what's best for ourselves. But God has purposed for the believer that he won't have them. God has purposed for his children. He says to Baruch, Seekest thou great things for thyself? Listen, seek them not. Why? You won't find them. You won't find them. You know what the world? They find them. The lost, they find great things for themselves. But God's people, He does not permit us, for the most part, to have these things. These worldly things. We won't have the great things of this world because these things, listen... They pull us away from our God. The things of this world, if we were given the desires of our flesh, you know what would happen? They would pull us from our God. Isn't that what happened to Solomon when he had all of those wives? Remember, he had so many of those concubines and wives. And what did the scriptures say? They, they pulled him away from God. They drew his heart away from God. And that's what worldly things do for God's people. And so God doesn't allow us to have these things, these honor of men. These things of the world and the honor of men only seem to elevate pride and not the glory of God. But God has purposed to pour contempt on all our pride and therefore for us, He crushes our prospects. He takes those ambitions, those things. He says, Seekest thou great things for thyself? And He crushes those things. If we seek them for ourselves, our dreams, the worldly ambitions, for the most part, God's people are not rich, they're poor. They're not strong, they're weak. They're not wise in the world, they're foolish. Isn't that what Paul said? He said that seeing our calling, brethren, that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Why? God has chosen the foolish things. You want to know what a foolish thing looks like? Look right here. You want to know what a weak thing looks like? Look right here. See, God's people, He has chosen the weak things to confound those things that are mighty, the foolish things of the world, to confound those that are wise. Believer, do you seek honor in things of this world? That's a question. It's an important one. Seekest thou these great things for thyself? Listen, God says, seek them not. Our Lord said to, says to his people, you shall be hated 
of this world. You want the honor of this world? You can't have it. <laughs> Why? This world will hate you. And the more we draw near to Christ, the more we preach the gospel of Christ, we will not, and we will not give consent to the false free will works religion of this age, they will hate you and despise you the more. You see, Baruch thought that he would be accepted. He thought to seek great things for himself, and God crushed his dreams. Why? Because it gave no glory to God. Gave no honor to God. This world will hate you. While those who are self-righteous, men-pleasers, the world will love them. Paul said, you that would live godly. Now what does that mean? I'm not talking about morality, although that may have, it, have something to do with it, but it's this. Those who live by faith. You would live godly. Here's living godly. Living by faith in Christ. Believing the gospel of God's grace, clinging to Christ alone. That's living godly in this present world. In Christ, you shall suffer persecution. So believer, let us in, lay this to heart. Whatever schemes we devise to prosper ourselves in this world, God must and will destroy them. He must and He will destroy them. Jesus said this, where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. Thus God will not suffer his sons to have their portion in this world. Isn't that right? Our portion is not in this world, is it? Our inheritance, we own everything, but not like this. God's not going to give it to us in this fallen condition. He's going to give it to us in glory. Our portion is in heaven. Our portion is God Himself and not in this world. Do you seek the things of this world, believer? Seek them not. Seek them not. Second thing we seek is ambition in religion. Religious ambition. Not just worldly things, riches and fame and honor and, and passions of the flesh. Those things seek them not, but there's also what about religious things? Dost thou seek greatness in religion? Do you seek greatness even among the, the sons of God, in the church of God? There's a vast difference between religious things and the things of Christ, things of His church. I'll tell you what, in, for instance, a lot of people have ambitions and desires to seek spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Those gifts that were given to the apostles, speaking in tongues and, and miracles. How many people seek after these spiritual gifts, these gifts of the Holy Spirit? Now listen, a man could have these gifts and still be lost. Isn't that right? Judas was one of those men. He had all the gifts that every apostle had. He could heal. He could perform miracles just like they did. And he was lost. So what good is it if a man has spiritual gifts and he has not Christ? Now these religious gifts, they often draw the admiration of men. They're pleasing to the flesh. They're pleasing to the flesh. Men desire to have these gifts in order to be to, to set themselves apart. That's what they really want. They want these gifts to set themselves apart. And I'll tell you this, even God's people, when they, they hear of these things and see of these things, even God's people wonder why we don't have these gifts. Even God's people could be prone to seeking these gifts. But I want to talk to more about uh, not those miracle gifts, but let's just talk about those gifts that some men have, like the gift of, of, of preaching. Isn't that a gift? The gift of, of, of uh, prayer. Some men have a gift in prayer. Some men have a gift in memorizing Scripture. Some men have a gift of being uh, 
of witnessing of the gospel while others don't have those sort of gifts. And what do we do? Sometimes we covet our brethren's gifts. Why? Seekest thou great things for thyself? Do you covet these things for the glory of God or for yourself? If they're for yourself, covet them not. Now gifts, the gift of preaching, that's a a gift that's uh, given for the edification of the church, isn't it? It's a good gift. He that desireth the office of a bishop desireth a good thing. It's a good gift. If God calls you to preach, that's a good gift. Few are called to preach. Not everyone's called to, to preach the gospel. But do you truly seek great offices and gifts for the glory of God, or seekest thou these things for yourself? To all who possess this gift of preaching, I tell you, there is a price. There is a price to pay for it. God takes great care to those he gives gifts so that no glory should ever be given to them. No glory. How often does God shut the mouths of his ministers, not allowing us to speak, not giving us liberty to speak at times, How many times does He hide our eyes from the power and effect of the Spirit that is working and the gospel we preach? So instead of pride, preaching doesn't, true preaching doesn't produce pride. We're made to feel the barrenness of ourselves. I can't tell you how many times that I've preached the gospel of Christ and had to go and hang my head in shame as though I felt there was no way I could have possibly declared it like it should have been. Why? Because I don't seek this for myself. No man who's a true preacher of God seeks this glory for himself. I tell you, with, with these gifts come great trials, great difficulties. Why? So that all the glory belongs to God. So if you are, if you are desiring to preach, if, there, if there's, the Lord is calling you to preach, then I'll tell you this, He's going to make sure it's not for yourself. Make sure it's not for yourself, but for the glory of God. Seek not the gifts of others. You know, there's even preachers seek the, the they hear other preachers, and they say, man, I wish I had that gift. Why? Seekest thou great things for thyself? Knowledge. Here's another one. Knowledge. Knowledge. How many believers labor and desire the great gift of of knowledge of the mysteries of the gospel? They desire to be great theologians and write books and read many books for the purpose of heaping up knowledge. Knowledge for knowledge's sake. Instead of hungering and thirsting after the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They hunger and thirst after knowledge for knowledge's sake. Instead of seeking to know Him, to know Him who is all in the Scriptures, they seek to puff up their selves with pride based on their knowledge. You know, Paul said this, that I might know Him. Now there's the knowledge you should be seeking after. Knowledge of not just knowledge of Him, but knowing Him, that I may know Him. You know, do you want to know about Christ or do you want to know Christ? There's a difference, isn't there? Do you want to know about redemption or do you want to know about the Redeemer? Do you want to know of His sovereignty or do you want to know the Sovereign One? There's a difference, friends. Seekest thou knowledge for thyself? Do you heap up knowledge? You know what? It, a man that heaps up knowledge for knowledge's sake, listen, is like that manna that they got extra. Remember, they, they picked up that manna and they picked up more than they needed. God said it breed worms and stinks. That's a man who knows it all. You got a man, you ever been around a know it all? A man who has an unteachable spirit. 
Is there anything more obnoxious than that? That's a man who seeks great knowledge for himself. No, when God gives us knowledge, and I tell you, you should want to know him. You should want to have more knowledge of him, knowing him. But not knowledge for knowledge's sake. Our Lord here says to Baruch, those that think they are, they are great, think they seeking after great things, he says, seek them not. Seek them not. But pastor, doesn't God, doesn't God say through the Apostle Paul, covet the best gifts? Yes. What are the best gifts? Are the best gifts the things of the world? Is that the best gifts? Are the best gifts religion, religious knowledge and religious gifts those are not the best gifts. What are the best gifts? The best gifts are faith, hope, and love. Those are the gifts that believers should covet. Those are the gifts that God gives His people that redound to His glory and not the glory of themselves. We seek those things. We seek to grow in the, the fruit of the Spirit. Those things that God gives. We seek to know uh, more of our God, no more of the blood and righteousness of Christ, the blood that cleanses us from sin, the righteousness that covers us. These are the great things. Listen to me this morning. Seekest thou great things for thyself, or do you seek Him? Believers, we should be seeking Christ. We should be looking for Christ, looking to Him. We are to seek the, the revelation of His grace and His power and His presence. And you know what that does? Does that elevate you or does that abase you? What does knowing Him do? It breaks our hearts, doesn't it? It breaks our hearts. It doesn't elevate us with pride. It breaks our hearts. It moves us to love and believe Him. But the soul of the self-righteous, what do they do? They loathe the gospel of Christ. Those that seek things for themselves, great things for themselves, they loathe the gospel of God's free grace and desire the great things of this world without Christ. Without Christ. But I'll tell you this, God's people, we, we are glad to hear of the gospel of Christ. We're glad to hear of Him, of His sovereign election, of His triumphant redemption, of the effectual calling and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. We're glad to hear things like this, that He keeps us and sustains us, that He will bring us to Himself without fail. These are things that God's people seek. They seek after Him. They seek to know Him to us, the gospel of Christ is the greatest thing to be desired. The greatest thing to be desired is Christ. I want Him. Now, the workmongers of this world, they seek things for their own honor, their own glory, and they loathe this light bread. Why do you think we come here and preach this gospel every time? Because we believe this is the great thing. This is, the, this is the thing God has prescribed by which He saves sinners through the preaching of His gospel. We, we cherish these things. Cherish His gospel. The religious desire to clean the outside of the cup, to appear moral, but fail to see the inward corruption and that Christ is the only remedy. But all who are God, the touched of God by His grace, what do we seek? We seek Him. This morning, I want to seek Him. I want Him. But yet we as believers must confess that we are still hindered by this old man of sin. We are still hindered by this old man of sin. That old man must be then exposed by God so that we do not seek great things for ourselves. 
That's what God was doing with this man. He was exposing things this man could not possibly see. And that's what God does. This morning I pray that God, if you are seeking great things for yourself, that God would expose this. Why? So that you might put it away. Seek them not, but rather seek the glory of Christ, the honor of Christ. Does this speak to your heart? I'll tell you what, let's see exactly what our Lord Jesus says about this. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I pray a spirit will lay this to every one of our hearts. This is exactly what God is saying to Baruch here. It's exactly what Christ says to us in Matthew 6 verse 19. Look at that. He says this, Lay not up for yourselves. What great things. What the world considers great. Treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But here's the good thing. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt nor thieves break through and steal. For where your treasure is, what? There will your heart be also. O oh, believer, where is your treasure? Is it in the great things of this life and this world? Or is it in Christ? Christ is the treasure of His people. Look at verse 25. Therefore, I say to you what? Take no thought for your life. Have you, he's not saying don't think about, your, about what you're doing in life. He's saying take no anxious thought for your life. Why? What you eat, what you drink, what you're going to put on your body... Why, the life's more than meat, the body's more than raiment. And then he says, consider the lilies of the field, consider the birds of the air. Doesn't God take care of them? Then why would you even consider that he wouldn't take care of you? Verse 31, therefore take no thought, saying what you'll eat or what you drink, or wherewithal shall you be clothed. For all these things do the heathen, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of these things. Believer, seekest thou great things of this life, of this world? Do you seek the great religion of this world? Gifts of, the relig of religion? I do pray that God would even now fix our eyes on Christ. Fix our eyes on Him who is our life, who is our salvation, who is our treasure. And look what He says. Here's this. This is what you should be seeking. Instead of great things for yourself, what should you be seeking? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Who is this kingdom of God? That's Christ. Seek first the kingdom of God, which is Christ the King. And listen, His righteousness. And what? All these things, your food, your clothes, that God knows you have need of those things. Believer, is your treasure Christ? Our master is Christ. Our sustainer is Christ. I like this hymn, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Midst flaming world and these arrayed with joy, I shall lift up my head. Therefore, he is our king. He is the object of our affection. Seek him. Seek to be found in him. And let us forsake the vain ambitions of the self and flesh so as to cling to Christ. Seekest thou great things for thyself? What did God say? What does God say? Seek them not. What are you to seek? Jesus Christ. Look to Him. Flee to Him. And what will you find? You'll find everything you need. You'll find redemption. You'll find peace. You'll find pardon. You'll find love, the love of God. You'll find a refuge for your soul in the midst of all your calamities. Now secondly, I want us to see this. Not only to see that uh, the evil of seeking things for ourselves, but the reason for God saying not to seek them. Look back at your text. I have to go through these really quickly here, I know. 
The reason God says not to seek them. Look back at your text in verse 5. He says, Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not for, because, behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. The evil that the Lord is bringing upon this, well, he's talking literally about the calamity of the destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of Jer Judah. And God by this displays His sovereignty in all providence. Look at back, look at, back at verse 4. He says, Thou shalt say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, that which I built up will I break down, and that which I have planted will I pluck up, even the whole land. God declares His sovereignty in this providence that caused this man great sorrow. That providence was causing him great affliction. And God says, Look, I built it, I planted it, and you listen. I'm going to pluck it up and there's no one to stop me. It was a dark providence. Why would he do it? He said this, I purposed it. I built it. I purposed it. Now, believer, has God dashed your plans and schemes? Has God crushed your hopes and dreams and brought them to nothing? Who did that? God did. God did. Why? Why did God do this? You pay attention. God did it for His glory and your good. God did it for His glory and your good. Do you desire the glory of God? Then I want you to know this. The glory of God is your good. It's for your good. But it never comes except through great trials and great suffering. You remember that poem I asked the Lord that I might grow in every grace and seek more earnestly His face? Was he that taught me to pray, and thus and he has answered prayer, but has been in such a way that almost drove me to despair. I hope that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest. You see, he thought great things for himself, didn't he? But what did God do? Instead, he made me feel my hidden evils of my heart, and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe. Crossed all my fair designs I schemed. Cast my feelings out and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Listen. Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answered prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou might seek thine all in me. You see why he does it? O oh, believer, seekest thou great things for thyself? If you do, you listen. God will pluck it up. God will cast it down. Not to destroy you, but listen, to refine you. To refine you. These trials, these, these, this destruction of all flesh. Listen, it was it good for Judah or evil? It was good. God restored them. You remember in 70 years, God restored them. What do you think God does for His people in these trials and afflictions? What is His purpose? It is that we might be stripped of pride. That we might fall at His feet seeking mercy and pardon and peace. That we should rest in His perfect love and grace. That we should rest in the perfect work of Christ and not in ourselves. And so by these great distresses and sorrows, by the ruin of our great things, God does make us long 
for his presence. Is, is that not true? Listen, something's wrong if that's not true. These great afflictions that God sends us, do they not drive us to Christ? Do they not move us to want his presence? Are you in the midst of affliction? Let me ask you this. Who sent it? Who ordained it? Who purposed it? Why? That you should not seek great things for yourself, but that you should seek the glory of God in Christ. That's why. This fire only refines us. And lastly, I want us to see this. Not only do we see the evil and foolishness of seeking great things for ourselves, not only do we see the purpose of God in destroying these ambitions, but we see this, the gift of God. This is the last thing. Look at this. He said, Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Why? Behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But, here's a promise of God to you. Thy life will I give thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. God promised this man Baruch, he said, look, your life is not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. You're going to be pursued by these evil men no matter where you go. But every time they seek your life, it'll be plucked from their hands. <laughs> It'll be plucked from their hands. As a brand plucked from the burning, so will I pluck thy life. I will save thy life from their hands. That's what God promised this man. But the greatest meaning of this, obviously, is a spiritual meaning. All of the elect redeemed of Christ. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God in grace gave us spiritual life, did he not? He says to us who, who are His children, He says this, Thy life will I give unto thee. Life. This morning, do you have spiritual life? I'll tell you this, if you have spiritual life, I know this, by God's grace and power, you will not seek those things for yourselves. You will seek the glory of God. Here's the evidence of spiritual life. You know what it is? Do you believe on the Son of God? Faith is the evidence of spiritual life. Do you have life? This morning, do you have life? True spiritual life abandons all hopes of self-righteousness and clings only to Christ. That's true life. If you don't have that, you have not life. If you, have, if you are clinging this morning to anything you have done or will do for God, you have no life. You are seeking great things for yourself. But we who believe in Christ, we believe that He is all our salvation, all our hope and acceptance with God. We are alive. Now this life, how did it come to you? By merit? By religious exercise? Is that how you receive this life we know this it is a gift of god isn't it it is a gift of god's grace that we are alive this life we have in our souls is a gift scripture says as many as received him to them gave he the power the right to become the sons of god even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. We were born of God. Born of God. I like this. Jesus said, I give unto my sheep eternal life. Eternal life. And what does he say after that? And no man shall, what? Pluck them out of my hands. That's exactly what is said by this next phrase. Look at this next phrase. It's very interesting. It's used in Jeremiah, I believe, four times. He said, I will give unto thee for a prey, thy life for a prey in all places whither thou goest. 
What does that mean for a prey? Well, God has given us life. This life is irreversible. It's immutable. In other words, nothing will be able to take it from you. Nothing will be able to take it from you. I think of a bird of prey. You know, you think of that. You, the prey is the little, little mouse. <laughs> That's the prey, isn't it? You see, our life is a weak, helpless, feeble little mouse. And we are surrounded by birds of prey. We are like sheep among wolves. We are weak and helpless victims of prey. But God says this, no one will be able to take this life from you. No one. I'll tell you this, we're surrounded by beasts of prey. You know the first beast of prey is this? How about self? Is that not a beast of prey that seeks to take your life? Satan the world, false religion. They are all seeking to draw us away from Christ. They are all tempting us to seek great things for ourselves instead of the glory of God. What about the beast of sorrow and grief who rob us of our joy and peace? But listen to this. God promises Baruch and us this, they will all fail. They will never be able to take your life. In other words, I will snatch your life out. I will snatch you out before they get you. They won't be able to touch you. Jesus said, no man shall pluck them out of my hand. Why? Because God purposed it. And God keeps our life. Just like Daniel in the lion's den. Do you think the lions had any chance of getting to him? No. God kept him. Those Hebrew children cast in the midst of the fire. God kept them. And here's the promise. Here's the promise of this. God will keep God will keep you. Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And he said, Of all that the Father hath given me, I should lose nothing but raise it up again at the last day. And so this morning, I, I ask you again, are you seeking great things for yourself? You who are believers in Christ, you seeking great things for yourself. Know this, most of our sorrow is coming from this coming from disappointments that we should never have sought for. Are you seeking after the world, after ambition and religion? Listen, God says, don't seek them. Why? There's a reason. God crushes our ambitions so that you should be restored, that you should be near Christ. And this is God's promise that, look, I'll give you a life. I'll give you life. And no man can take it from you. I pray that the Lord would bless this and comfort you in the midst of your afflictions when God does destroy our, our dreams. Because God intends for your good, these things for your good, so that you would cling to Christ. Hold fast to Him, believer. He's our hope. He's our treasure. He's our life. Our gracious Father, I pray you'd bless the word according to your mercies. Forgive us our sins. Lead us in all our days. And I pray that Christ will be honored. In Jesus' name, amen.